We're in Philippians. If you would turn there, uh, we're in chapter 3 of Philippians. We've been walking through this book of the Bible. It's a New Testament book written by the Apostle Paul, formerly known as Saul. Saul was powerfully converted. He was a former, we're going to hear about this in the next several weeks, uh, he was a former hater of Christianity. Uh, he persecuted and even was a part of the killing of Christians. God saved him and powerfully has worked in his life. He became a missionary serving and giving his life to the service of Jesus Christ by planting churches. The Philippian church was one of those churches that he planted. And he's writing a letter of encouragement to the Philippian church. They were a good church, I remind you. They were doing a great work. They were a model church in many ways. But Paul is concerned about this church. And we're going to hear about that. And we're going to be challenged this morning about some of his concerns. Let's read God's word. Let's pray. And let's get into it. Philippians chapter 3 verses. We'll just look at three verses today. Philippians 3 says this, finally, my brothers, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things to you is no trouble to me and is safe for you. Look out for the dogs. Look out for the evildoers. Look out for those who mutilate the flesh. For we are the circumcision who worship by the Spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh. Let's pray. Father, thank you, Lord, for this morning, for the opportunity to come and gather and worship you. Let us be grateful for that, God. God, we just want to acknowledge this morning the struggle that every soul, every human soul has with itself. I pray that you would help us to zone in on that reality, God, that we are here to hear from you. God, we put ourselves under the authority of your word. It's your word, God. It's the word above all words. It is from your mouth. And God, I pray for myself that you'd help me to declare it properly and correctly. But God, it is a word that speaks to the very inward part of our souls. And so God, I pray that you would allow us uh, prepare our hearts in such a way that you can speak to us by the power of the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, do a work inside of our lives by helping examine our hearts and our own minds such that we might be transformed from the inside out. God, we pray that you will do this work. We are in desperate need, and I pray that our hearts would be desperate. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, I've always wanted to tell this, this sermon illustration, and I think I finally found a place to, to fit it in. Uh, and, and it's the story of when I was a little kid, I was a Star Wars fan. You know, I grew up, I was a, I was a little kid in the 70s, right? And so if you were a little boy in the 70s, especially a little boy, you were a Star Wars fan, right? So infatuated was I with Star Wars that... Um, and I didn't really live in a very good neighborhood. I just got to set the, stu- the, 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 the story up here. Uh, I, it was a rough neighborhood, you might say. There was a lot of ornery little kids in my neighborhood doing a lot of mischievous things. But there were some older boys in the neighborhood that were aware of my fatuation with Star Wars. And they took it upon themselves to create this uh, story that Star Wars was real. That Darth Vader and... CP3O and Luke Skywalker and all these heroes were real people, and that they were in communication with these Star Wars characters. They had this little room that they'd go into, and these mysterious noises would come out of that room, and I'd have to stay on the outside because it was a secret room, and these noises would come out, and suddenly there'd be these messages from Luke Skywalker or Boba Fett or these famous people that I was infatuated with, and we would run over to out in the woods to, to see these people, and I would miss them, of course. Suddenly, they were, they were over behind that tree, and I missed them. And, but I was, I was in, headlong. This went on for months, probably. I don't remember. I was probably seven, eight years old. But these, uh, these boys who were probably 12, 13, 14, they had me going, and they had me hook, line, and sinker. I don't remember exactly how I figured it out that it wasn't real, probably my mom or somebody trying to convince me, but I was fully convinced. But 
I remember being severely uh, disappointed, heartbroken, you might say. I never forgot that. I'd been duped. And I say that because there is a real, and to, and to change the, the, the trajectory, there is a real reality in religion, even in Christianity, that you can be duped. We're not just talking about uh, little good little kids having a good time at the expense of another little kid. As heartbreaking as it was, I got over it. But there is a strong warning, friends, throughout the Bible, and especially in the New Testament, of a kind of false teaching, a kind of a false uh, religion, a movement that is at work inside of the church that leads to a dead end. We call it legalism. You know, many times we think of sin as the Las Vegas sins of life, like the lust and the lies and the addictions and all these big, ugly things that everybody knows that's wrong. But just as dangerous, and in fact, I would say more dangerous, more venomous in Jesus and his talking, and Paul here, he's calling them names, is the reality of legalism, false teaching. A performance-based religion. Jesus warned us of this. Matthew 7, 21 through 23. Of verses that were, some of you are very familiar with. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. There's the dead end. They, they thought they were okay. They were naming the name of Jesus. But the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven... On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? They were teaching in the name of Jesus. Preaching. They were casting out demons, doing awesome works, and doing many mighty works in my name, Jesus says. And I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. This should cause us to do a, 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 a looking into our heart this morning. And this text this morning serves as a litmus test, I believe, to look into our souls, that we might not be guilty of what Jesus says here in Matthew 7, that we might come to the end and come and see Jesus face to face and hear, well done, good and faithful servant, enter my rest, and not, I never knew you. So these are serious, weighty things. And G Paul starts here with the command to rejoice in the Lord. Now this word rejoice is different than the word happiness. And if you've been around Christianity, I'm sure you've heard, heard this uh, explained before. But let me just remind you that happiness is not a bad thing. It's a good thing, right? We know that. But happiness, if you, one commentator pointed out, is rooted in the word hap, uh, or where we get the word happening it is a word that is rooted in the reality of having an emotional experience rooted in human experiences and circumstances. In other words, it's temporary, friends. Happiness is a good human experience rooted in temporary realities. So it's not wrong, it just fades. We all know that. The word for rejoice, however, and the phrase here, rejoice in the Lord, is different than happiness. And very important that we understand that. It is a joy that is rooted in a relationship. Think of it like a mother. Uh, I'm watching Peyton here. She's getting miserable in her pregnancy, right? Nine months she's got to, to do this, right? I don't know how far along it is, but I'm hoping it gets here fast for her because she's already struggling, right? That's okay. But this is hard stuff. And then the, the whole child labor thing, I don't need to tell you that. That's not fun. But what happens? <laughs> amen. There's an amen. We're on the right track. We're awake. What happens in the moment of birth? All the pain. All the... All the struggle for the nine months, there is a rejoicing. It's different than happiness, isn't it? And it's rooted in a relationship. This little person that we've never even really met before, we don't know anything about them or what they're going to be, that is rejoicing, right? Completely different 
than happiness. It's different because it's rooted in a person, in a relationship. And what Paul is saying, that the ultimate joy that we can know as human beings is in this reality of knowing Jesus Christ, a relationship with Jesus Christ, that despite our circumstances, which may or not bring happiness, there is an opportunity to rejoice in the Lord, whether in sickness or whether in health, whether in failure or success, whether you suffer loss or gain. Nobody, no one can rob you of the joy that we have in knowing Jesus Christ personally. That's very important. That is the theme, really, of Philippians. And not only does he command us to rejoice in the Lord before we get into the text deeply, we need to also see that he's, he says there that there's this reminder ministry. He says, I write the same things to me, to write the same things to you is of no trouble to me, and it's safe for you. Now, what is he saying there when he says, I'm writing the same things to you? Now, a lot of people are not exactly sure. I think, personally, he's talking about the joy. It, it, in the Philippian book of Philippians, he keeps talking about the joy that we have in Jesus Christ. But whatever it is, and commentators argue about what he's really talking about there, what I want to point out to you is the reality that Christianity, in the message of preaching, and in the, in the, the message of the, of the Bible, and in the gospel, in the New Testament, is a repetitive theme. One of the lures, friends, of legalism that gets us off track is the reality that it appeals to our wandering souls. It appeals to our religion, performance-based religion, and that uh, it, it gives us something that we can hang our hat on. We like nice, tangible rules to follow, right? I like that. That feels comfortable for me. I can get settled with a nice rule. It, it gives us rituals that we like if we go through the rituals and do the right things. Then I feel good about my relationship with God. It gives us titles and external measurements, again, that we can grab onto. And not that those things are bad in themselves, but they end up defining and, and being what are these rules and these rituals and these uh, measurements that we create become our comfort in religion. The message of the gospel, friends, is hard and it's challenging. And we must not try to find a work around it in that school this morning. The issue of the Christian faith and the battle that we don't like the faith that we kind of want to get, squirm off the altar is the battle with sin in our lives. That's what we don't like to deal with. So it's easy to create a nice little set of standards or rituals that we can jump through and not deal with the real issue of what's going on in our hearts. Our hearts, our fleshly hearts, our flesh can, can confuse the battle. The world likes to lure us away from the battle. And Satan likes to confuse us. And that's where legalism often pops in. Replacing God's gospel, the gospel of Jesus Christ, the idea of repentance or turning away from sin, the idea of forgiveness, the concepts of humility and being broken, the, the reality of the grace of God empowering the Christian life. All the elements of the gospel are replaced with a set of rules and rituals that we can follow. The point is this, what I have found over preaching the gospel or the word of God over the last seven years is that we are in a ministry of reminding people of these very basic core realities of the gospel of Jesus Christ answering the battle of sin in our lives. And we can't get around that. We want to get off on bunny trails and tangents, but that is what is going on day to day in the Christian walk. That's why he repeats these things over and over. He doesn't want us to be robbed. Now, this morning, I want to offer up six questions. I'm going to put them up there. I pray that you write them down. It's, it's six questions derived from the text that are going to help us to examine our own hearts to see if we are off track, if we are on a, a pace for a dead end, 
that we might see Jesus at the end of our lives when we breathe our last breath in here, I never knew you. Or, and it happens as Christians that we get off track, that we might get back on track into gospel living. And so these six questions are designed to examine our own hearts first. But maybe these six questions could also, after you examine your own heart and apply them to yourself, you might be able to use them when you go to the holidays gatherings with your friends and family when you talk about religion and politics. And you might just use these six questions as a great little discussion starter. That was supposed to be funny, but it wasn't. I'm sure your family would really appreciate them, you asking these six questions. Now, honestly, I really do think that these, are, these might be, maybe you get in a side little discussion with somebody, and you always wonder, what do I do? What do I say? Here's six things, six little things you might be able to go through. Even if you took a few of them, they'd be enough to start a good discussion about what Christianity truly is. And before we get to the questions, one last thing. We need to understand why Paul is so worked up. I mean, he uses some strong language here. He calls them dogs, <laughs> right? That's not nice. This is kind of the um, anti-church growth method right here from Paul, right? I get these emails from these church growth movements. Uh, he's probably, they're not, in these church growth movement emails, they're not recommending calling people dogs, right? But that's what Paul does. He calls them dogs, and so this is serious business. Paul is worked up. He's worked up because he's worried about the church. He's concerned about his church, the church that he helped start. He's concerned about its health, and he's concerned because of legalism in the form of what we call Judaizers. This is, I think, the context that we need to understand for why Paul is upset and what he's dealing with. I want you to understand that what Judaizing is and what these legalisms that were seeping into the church. Legalism, friends, just to give you a definition of what it is. Here's, here's the definition that I've taken from a couple different sources that I kind of pieced together. Legalism, the practice or adherence to behaviors, disciplines, and rules in order to achieve salvation and right standing with God. Let me say that again. The practice of adher adherence to behaviors, disciplines, or rules in order to achieve salvation and right standing before God. Legalism is dangerous, friends, because it robs God of his power. Or attempts to rob God. You can't rob God of his power. It's impossible. But it attempts to. By dealing with sin and the issues of sin... In, in ways that won't solve the real problem, as we're going to see. It appeals to our self-righteousness. It appeals to our, our, the human heart. It gives us these paths that we think we can grab onto. But in the end, it doesn't deal properly with sin. And friends, human beings, the human soul, is in a wa war with God, whether you recognize this or not, in with sin. We want to go our own way. And what the law does is offer us a way to clean up ourselves without really dealing with the sin. If we just obey the law, then, hey, we're righteous and we're good with God. That's not how God has determined to deal with sin. I like to think about the law and how it can't deal with the, the problem of sin, like the movie Weekend at Bernie's. Right? Now, it's, you know, maybe you don't even know what that is, and it's been like 20 years, it's a movie from the 80s, I think. But I, what I remember about that movie is Bernie is a dead guy, but they put glasses and a suit on him and prance him around like he's alive. He goes to meetings, he, get, he goes places, and, but he's really dead. But people think he's alive. Friends, that's what the law offers. It's like a dead Bernie going around. We're trusting in this thing that really can't bring us life. It really is dead. Now, specifically what was happening with these Judaizers in the churches, think about what was happening as Paul preached the gospel through, the, through Asia, through into Europe. He would preach the gospel and Jews would hear it and Gentiles. Those are not Jews. That's us. I'm not aware of any Jewish people here. Maybe there are. We're all glad you're here. And... Uh, 
<laughs> Very glad. Gentiles, though, in Jewish mind were outside. They were outsiders. They weren't God's people. Now, Jews looked down on Gentiles. But suddenly, there are Jew and Gentiles hearing the gospel message, hearing about grace, hearing about that our lawless deeds can be forgiven, not through the law, but through the work of Jesus Christ, the forgiveness offered in, in the cross, and the hope that we find in the resurrection. And Jews and Gentiles were all believing this, and now suddenly they were gathering together in a setting like this together, where before they would have been totally separated. And they're excited about forgiveness, and they're excited about grace, but here's what was happening. Some of the Jewish people were uncomfortable. They were looking across the aisle, and they were uncomfortable with the reality that their brother and uh, their Gentile brother wasn't circumcised. They were, it moved them wrong that their brother and sister in Christ that were Gentiles were going over to uh, Aunt Martha to have hawk knuckle sandwiches, as I like to say, uh, for, for lunch. They were eating pork, and, and Jews didn't eat pork, so they were uncomfortable, so they wanted them uh, they were uncomfortable with the reality that they didn't observe, observe the Sabbath laws. And they had to. And so they were wanting them to get on board. You know, they would say, they would go to the Old Testament and say, look, at, here's what God's people do. They get circumcised, and they obey the Sabbath laws, and they follow the rituals. And they don't eat pork and things like that. And you need to get on board. It's great that you have Jesus, and we're thankful for forgiveness. But to be righteous before God, we must obey and follow the laws and the ceremonial laws and the rituals of the Old Testament. Now, friends, the reality is there's probably nobody showing up at your door and asking you to obey the Sabbath. Maybe. That's, that's, there's a, there are teachers and sects out there that do teach that in, in Christianity, and that's wrong. There are uh, probably nobody getting upset with you for eating pork or checking to make sure you're circumcised, I hope. Whew. Got past that one. <laughs> but, friends, these things sneak in in other ways. What this is, is Jesus plus. That's what I'd like to say. We, we don't, we, maybe you're not being forced to become a Jew, but the reality that Jesus is not sufficient, the, uh, the, I, the idea that G, there must be something more than the gospel to be at work in your life, that is a real battle. That is a real struggle in our lives. And it is a pull that we need to work through. And that's what was going on. And so with that, I want to ask six questions. From the text. First in verse 2. Let me just read it. He says again. Look out for the dogs. Look out for the evildoers. Look out for those who mutilate the flesh. Question 1. Are you trusting in titles? Are you trusting in your identity of certain religious groups that you participate in? Or traditions, specifically family tradition, as a basis for your relationship with God? Now, I say that because he says, look out for the dogs. Now, not to upset dog lovers. We are dog lovers in our house. Our dog is more like a child than a dog. We're not talking about little foo-foo dogs that live in the house and sleep in your bed. What we're talking about here is these scavenger, ruthless dogs. Like if you've ever been to a third world country and wandered the streets of, of, of bad parts of town, you'll see these kind of dogs. You know what I'm talking about. They basically have foam coming from their mouths. These were scavenger dogs. And here's the thing. Gentiles, Jews, called Gentiles dogs. This was a racist term. This is racism, friends. Jews considered themselves superior to Gentiles. They were clean. Gentiles, the dogs were unclean. They were of God's covenant promise. The Gentiles were out of the covenant promise. Despite the reality that the Old Testament calls for them to become part of the covenant promise, and is, they are part of it, 
But here's the thing, friends. We can miss the significance here of the reality in our lives. Before I was a believer in Christ, if you would have asked me, are you a Christian? I would have said, yeah, all Americans are Christians, right? I mean, I go to church on Christmas and Easter. I know a few stories about Jesus. But the truth was, I was not a Christian any, going on Christmas and Easter any more than uh, if, if uh, Ben Funkhauser was a mechanic because he stands in a garage, right? We, we use that. Ben's not very good mechanically, by the way, I don't think, from what he's told me. Just to pick on Ben. He's fun to pick on. But friends, here's the reality. What we need to check our hearts is that we can find our identity when, with this reality of whether we are right with God and we can say things like, yes, I'm a member of a church. Yes, I go to church on Sunday. Yes, I'm, hey, I'm a pastor, right? You're, if you're a pastor, then you're a Christian. Not so. We have seen, especially in the last five or ten years, many men claim and preach the word fall away. Preaching the gospel. Now whether they are, I don't know their heart or soul. But we can find, friends, our identities in this religious pedigree. And it's dangerous. And let me just say something to the young people that are churchgoers. This is always one of the things I worry about for my kids that I tell them all the time. Your faith is not your parents' faith. Just because your parents are Christians doesn't mean you are. This isn't inherited. And so it must be your faith. Do you believe in Jesus? Do you have a relationship with Christ? Are you seeking God? Not riding in on the coattails of a family member. Romans 8, 28 and 29 says, For no one is a Jew who is merely one outward. They thought they were Jewish just because they were circumcised. Nor is circumcision outward and physical. But a Jew is one inwardly. A Jew is somebody who is God's people. It has nothing to do with circumcision or going through religious ritual. Is Has God circumcised the heart? The circumcision is a matter of the heart by the spirit, not by the letter. His praise is not from man, but from God. The spirit of God has done a work in our hearts. We must be born again. That's what it means to be a Christian. To be born again. To be born again. Uh, and have sin removed from our lives, and that by the Spirit of God, we have a renewed heart, right with God, desiring to live for God. Friends, there are not black, brown, there, is no, there are no groups. There are two groups that, that the Bible gives us, the saved and the unsaved. Those who are born again and those who are not. It doesn't matter what color you are. And God is no respecter of Religion, races, or any, he, he, from every tribe and tongue and color, he accepts and people come into his kingdom. So the question, are you trusting in titles, identities in certain groups or traditions as a basis for your relationship with God? Question number two, do you feel like your sin and your failures have disqualified you from knowing Jesus Christ personally? Say it again. Do you feel like your sin or your failures have disqualified you from knowing Jesus personally? Many people will say to me, there's no way that God could love and accept me. I've failed too many times. I've done too much wrong. You don't understand. Friends, shame on you. You need to repent of that. Because here's what he says. The second look out here is against the evildoers. See, the evildoers were not Gentiles. They were Jews gone bad, right? We all know this, living in a small town. It's real easy. One of the things you love about living in a small town is, like, especially with kids, like, if my kids are up to something wrong, I usually get a phone call. Hey, saw your son uh, down at the corner acting like a hooligan, right? <laughs> okay, I'm going to go take care of that. But the other part about living in a small town like that is, you get the name, right? You get the scarlet letter. You get identified. You have the titles. People nudge you and they whisper about you. And the, right? And the, we know this. This is, 
This is the bad part about living in a small town. Like any culture or community, same thing with the Jewish people. Evildoers were Jews gone bad. They weren't following the religious program. Here's the thing. Jesus loved the evildoers. He hung out with the evildoers. You find him giving, condo- giving, uh, uh, picking up the adulterous women. We find him constantly in trouble with the religious uh, to-dos in, in the, that community, in that culture, the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Why was he in trouble? Because he hung out with the drunkards and the sinners and the tax collectors. You see, Jesus is not afraid of sin. And what Paul is doing here is reversing the thing. He's calling the evildoers, just like he did with the dogs, right? The dog, the people calling people the dogs were actually the dogs. And here, the ones calling people evildoers or seeing people as evildoers will actually the evildoers. Why? Because they were leading people astray, away from the answers that God had given them to deal with sin. You see, friends, it's not the issue of sin. It's the issue of what we do with sin that is the issue. Jesus told of my favorite parable in Luke 18. It's one I go to often, but it's so rich and good, and it, I think it spells this out very cl- correctly. Uh, Luke 18, 9 through 14. Jesus told this parable for those who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and they were treated others with the contempt. They looked down on others. This is legalism. This is the fruit of legalism. And he said this, two men went up to the temple to pray. One was a Pharisee. The other was a tax collector. The Pharisee standing by himself prayed thus, God, listen, he uses God language. I thank you I'm not like these other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. So he sees himself as good and on the right side of God. He's righteous. I fast twice a week. I give all that I get. He's boasting in his works. But the tax collector, by the way, a tax collector, friends, just so you have the right context, would be on the level of a child pedophile in our culture. They were the low of the low, the evil of the evil doers. The tax collector uh, stood afar off. He stood in the back. He wouldn't, he, he wouldn't even see him. Probably he's outside the door listening. He says he wouldn't even lift his eyes up to heaven, but he beat his breast saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. See, he's dealing with this sin. And he's offering it to God, that God would be gracious and merciful to help him. And our God is a gracious and merciful God with our sin. Nobody is beyond the bounds of God's grace, despite what you think. Jesus says, this is the best part, I tell you that this man went to his house justified. That means right with God. Rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. Friends, you are not disqualified from knowing Jesus Christ personally based on your sin. But you are disqualified if you remain in your sin. And Jesus Christ is offered forgiveness from sin when we come and we confess it and give it to him and turn away from it. God does The work. This is what it means to be a Christian. Romans 8 1, we read that. There is therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Are you in Christ Jesus? Number three, question number three. Are you trusting in your religious traditions, keeping rituals, or being your disciplines in order to be right with in a right relationship with God? You see, he says here, the third lookout in the text in verse 2 is that look out for those who mutilate the flesh. This is a word play on circumcision, which we all know what that's about. And, and I don't want to go into that, but this was a mutilation of the flesh. And what he was getting at is uh, they were the people of God were calling people to be in right relationship with God by adhering uh, to all the Old Testament rituals and rules. So if you, to how to deal with sin? Well, you brought your bull and your goat to the temple, and you had it killed, all right? And then the, the, the 
blood of the bull and goat represented a, a, a forgiveness of sin, an offering, a sacrifice to God for a temporary relief from the guilt of our conscience. That's what the Old Testament sacrificial system was about. So your sin was put on this little poor lamb, and then you could feel good and go home. But guess what? Then you sin again. So guess what you got to do? You got to go back and sacrifice another lamb. Here's what Jesus or the Bible says about this system. For it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. What worth or value does us the, the blood of a goat offer nothing, but the blood of Jesus Christ, friends, was worthy. It was a worthy sacrifice, and it was able to remove the stain of sin. And friends, this is how God deals with uh, our sin. The ultimate lamb of God was not found in the sacrificial system, but in the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. And then the Jews would come along and say, to be right with God, you had to follow the Ten Commandments, right? And so you have this run-in that Jesus has. You remember this with the rich young ruler. The man says, how can I be right with God? How can I be saved, basically? And what does Jesus say? Obey all the Ten Commandments. And what does the man say? I've been doing that since I was in, in Sabbath school. No, we hadn't. Jesus knew that. And so he said, go sell everything you have and give it to the poor. And what did he, the man went away sad because he loved his money. And what is the law all about? It's about loving God, but he loved his money. He didn't love God. Friends, you can never keep the law. James 2.10 says, whoever tries to keep the whole law but fails at one point, he's guilty of it all. Friends, keeping the law keeping rituals, traditions. We fall into this ourselves. If I have my checklist and follow my checklist, then I'm, gonna, I'm okay. Like, how to get back on track with God after I sinned? Well, I'm, I'm going to start reading my Bible. I'm going to start praying. I'm going to start going to church. Hey, those are all good things. But they are not a relationship with God. The reason we pray is, is that so we can get into real relationship with God. The reason we read our Bible is so that we can seek God and His will for our life. The reason we come to church is that we can worship together and, and God speaks to us. We weren't even thinking about these things and God speaks to us deeply into our hearts. It's about relationship. It's not about external things and we can fall into this trap of going through religious ritual. Romans 4 5 says no one to the one who works his wages are counted him as a gift but as his due and to the one who does not work but believes in him who justifies the ungodly his faith is counted as righteousness friends when somebody asks you i ask this question all the time when we go around or when we meet somebody what is the basis for your are, are you a christian and they'll say yes i i'm i'm a good person Right? In other words, there's some standard that they've created in their mind that they've decided that they're good. And I say, whose standard are you looking to? You see, the point of the law is to reveal to us how, sh how short we are of keeping the law. That's the point of the law. We can't get clean through the law, but God reveals to us how short we fall in keeping the law. Friends, we are not good because of the things that we do. We are good because we have trusted Christ and his righteousness has come and, and upon our lives, into our lives, into our hearts. Question number four. Has your salvation produced in you a desire to serve Jesus with your life? Has sal your salvation that you're claiming or do you know Jesus in a way that causes you that I want to serve Jesus Christ with my life? You see, in verse 3, uh, um, he goes on here to say that we're going to worship by the Spirit of God. That those who are of the circumcision worship, by, worship God by the Spirit of God. 
And the word here to worship is to serve God. That's what it means to be a Christian, is that my life is given back in service to God. Paul, writing to the Thessalonian church, says this, For they themselves report concerning us a kind of reception that we had among you, and how you turned to God from idols to serve the living God. This is how we live. We live as Christians in service to God. The Judaizers were saying how we live is by obeying the law. Christians, however, don't live that way. We live in service to God. We live by daily, and this is the battle, by daily, hourly, saying, God, I want to serve you in my life today. God, help me to fight the battle of the bondage of sin today in my life. Help me to live in my life in a way that's going to glorify and honor you. I have been made righteous by you and by your work. Now I want to reflect who you are in my life. Friends, this is the good news of, the, of being a Christian. That we're not, we have a hope to live for every day. That despite where we're at in our lives and despite what's going on in our lives, we have this testimony that every day we can get up and say, God, I'm going to live for you today. Even when things go south, even in the midst of failures or trials or troubles, we can say, God, even in this, I want to honor you. I want to glorify you. God, will you help me to live for you? I want to bring a testimony in your life. I want to be a man or a woman who reflects your character. I want to be a truth teller, even when it hurts. This is the life of a Christian. That I, I, We love to live for Jesus. Even though I don't like, uh, it's a struggle sometimes. I don't. It's easier maybe to, to lie. I love telling the truth. The reality of, of lust is powerful. But I love to be faithful and to live for God and honor Him in being sexually pure. This is the life of a Christian is that it says, I want to live for Jesus day to day, every day. And one of the trappings, again, of legalism is to put it on the big stuff, right? I'm doing big things for Jesus. I'm doing all these big things for God. And avoiding the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives, in the, in the crevices and cracks in the small areas of our lives. The Holy Spirit, friends, works in us on daily, hourly, minute by minute, giving us opportunity in whatever we find ourselves to live for Jesus Christ in our lives. Friends, this is what being a Christian is. It's not easy. It's not hard. We sometimes get off track. But to live by the Spirit of God is the way a Christian lives. That's what it means to be a Christian. I want to live to bring God glory. Question number five. Is Jesus Christ the central treasure of your life? He says there in verse three, that we boast in the glory, or we glory in Jesus Christ. The word glory is to boast, to make much of. Jews boasted as this man that we looked at in Luke 18, they boasted in their, their, their works and what they've been doing for God. But friends, we boast in Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone. Any goodness, any good thing in our lives, any power, Anything that has come into our lives is, comes, we acknowledge, is, comes from God and God's goodness in our lives. And so what else are we going to do? We can't take credit. We can't look for, for our hope or the glory in, in, in things in, of this world because we've come to know Christ Jesus. I say this all the time in counseling or in, 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 in just preaching and teaching. If you can find somebody else in this world, a real tangible example, an illustration, not some fairy tale of, of love, a better definition of love, a better, a better example than the forgiveness of Jesus Christ. If you can find some greater hope in this world that's real and true, then please tell me about it. 
See, Jesus Christ is the ultimate. Jesus Christ is the, the, the one that we boast in. Why look to anything else? Christians are people who have come to this great reality that any other offering of hope or love or happiness in this world will fail or is pales in comparison to knowing Jesus Christ personally. And friends, this slips in our lives in many ways. I think of one of the things that we run into where, where false gods, false hopes slip into our lives. I think about, we, we have this discussion about yoga. People ask, is it wrong for Christians to do yoga? Right? We'll look at it. Yoga is a Hindu practice, right? It's, it's like you're, you're doing these things to a Hindu god. Um, why? I don't, I'm not, to me it's just stretching, okay? I'm going to tell you how I process through this, right? Stretching is good. I like stretching. Meditation is good too. I like to meditate. But your mind is not a vacuum. And when you, when you meditate, you're meditating on something. And what I'm saying is, when I stretch, I, it feels good, and I, I want to take good care of this body. That's God glorifying. I want to honor Jesus with my body. It's good to take care of your body. And I want to meditate, but when I meditate, when I stretch, I'm just going to pray to people. I'm going to pray for people. I'm going to pray the word. I'm going to, you know, if you, do that. Make it about Jesus. Don't get wrapped up. This is how these things distract us away. My life is about Jesus, so I'm not going to get into this weird practice that's related to Hindu religion, right? I'm gonna, no, my life as a Christian is about Jesus. So I'm going to stretch, that's good, and I'm going to pray to Jesus while I do it. Or pray for people. Pray for lost people. I'm going to meditate through the word of God while I stretch. Fine. And that feels really good. And I've glorified Jesus in it. But you see how that, that, these things slip in? Friends, the Christian life is to say, in my marriage, I want to glorify Jesus. Jesus is the center. In my work, I want to glorify Jesus. This is what it means to be a Christian. In my ministry, it's not about just getting up here and making people think I'm good and about titles and things. I want to glorify Jesus Christ in my life. This is the heartbeat of a Christian. This is the mindset that we want to glorify Christ. And we can't get around that as much as we want to squirm off the altar. Jesus is always on our minds, our hearts. Question number six. Is your life as a Christian marked by a sensitivity to sin? The sins of your heart. And growth in Christianity by repentance. Is your life as a Christian, marked by sensitivity to sin and growth through repenting, turning away from sin. The last thing he says is, is we have no confidence in the flesh as we close. Now, let's be clear about what confidence is and isn't. It's not wrong for me when I'm playing golf, for instance, to say, dude, I'm going to hit this on the, I'm going to hit this on the green, right? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to knock this next to the green, right? I'm confident in my abilities of my golf swing to hit it on the green. Th those are, there's different kind of confidences in this world. At the same time, I want to acknowledge that God has given me the gift to swing a club and to be out here in, this, in his creation, right? I, I can't lose sight of that. It's not wrong for us then, friends, to have confidence in our jobs, I can, I, when I show up to do something, whatever your profession is, we should have confidence that I want to do a good job for the glory of God. I'm confident to somebody, I can do a good job for you. I'm going to try to do the best job I can. If I screw it up, I'll make it right. So God has given us gifts and abilities, and we should have confidence in those. But what we're talking about here is spiritual confidence in our flesh. Friends, the reality that the Bible teaches us is that we cannot trust our hearts. Our hearts lead us astray. The Christian life, then, friends, is a battle 
to be careful and sensitive to what is going on in our hearts. Paul had knowledge of the Bible that would make you your head spin. It would have been very easy for him to just trust in his knowledge and his understanding of the Bible and of God. He knew it in and out. Friends, it's easy as we get through the Christian life to trust in our experiences and our knowledge. It's easy for me to show up at a counseling session and not pray and ask God to work. It's easy to step into the pulpit and rely upon my knowledge of theology or whatever. And it's easy for all of us to trust in the past, our experiences, our knowledge of God. And we must fight against that. People who are truly Christians, friends, are sensitive to what is going on in our hearts. The sensitivity to sin wielding its ugly head in our lives, and we have a, 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 a pulse on that all the time, or, or fighting that battle and dealing with it. Martin Luther gave his 95 theses. You might be familiar with them. They're the ones that set off the Protestant Revolution, the Revolution, the Protestant Reformation, sorry. Number one on that was repentance. The heart and life of a Christian is to seek repentance. We put no confidence in the flesh. And because we put no confidence in the flesh, we're constantly examining our hearts and saying, where does my heart need to go to change? Where do I need to repent and turn away from my sin and my, my trusting in myself and turn to God? And this is the life of a Christian. This is how we know Again, we're Christians. Friends, in that examination of our lives, we fail. Part of Christian life, friends, is failure. And this is where I want to close. Because over and over, I have this same conversation with Christians. They are disappointed in themselves. Sin has wreaked its ugly play in your life in whatever form that may take and the 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 work of satan is to cause you to say hey i'm I'm gonna trust i'm gonna turn away from god or i'm gonna trust in some kind of i'm gonna get cleaned up and i'm gonna work harder i'm gonna try harder friends the point of working through and being sense of repentant is that god sanctifies us or changes us he exposes our sin so that he might cause us to deal properly with our sin by confessing it and turning to God and turning away from it such that we conquer and we get victory over sin and we become stronger in the faith. This is what it means to be a Christian. So when we get exposed, when we fall in and we, 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 it gets ugly, that is part of God's plan and purpose in strengthening us in the Christian walk. And that's what it means to be a Christian, friends. As we get to the table of God, this is what we do now. We examine our hearts and our lives and say, am I in the faith? Now is an opportunity when we come to the table of God to examine our hearts and say, is there sin in my life that I need to, to look for, that I need to turn away from, that I need to repent of? And what we do here at Redeemer is we want to give you an opportunity. We're going to play some music. You're going to listen for a little while and reflect on your own soul and ask God, where are the areas of my life that I need to be sensitive to and repent of and turn from? And the offering of the, the, the elements that we're getting ready to go, they represent something. They mean something to us. The bread that is in this, the cup represents the life of Jesus Christ, his perfect life. The reality that, look at we don't add up. We never will add up. Jesus added up on our behalf. He kept the law perfectly. We did not. And it's his life that we're entering into heaven and why we have salvation through his life his perfect life and not ours secondly is the blood the wine the juice that's there in the cup it represents 
Jesus Christ offering a cleansing of the sin that we've committed, making us clean and right with God. Those are vitally important to us. And so the other thing that you need to consider is if you're not a Christian here this morning, that you would consider the reality that this is not for you. It's okay to pass. If your heart is not in a good place or if you're not a Christian, these things were meant for those who love Jesus and are willing to turn away from their sin and, and, and repent and turn to God. Anybody can do that. And if that's you this morning, then you're welcome to the table of God to take of these elements. So we're going to take a few minutes and be quiet and humble, and then we will uh, take together. Let's reflect. of God says, for I received from the Lord Jesus what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night that he was betrayed, he took the bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you, do this in remembrance of me.
In the same way, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Father, we thank you for this morning. God, help us to reflect in our hearts. God, that you would help us to see the seeds of legalism and trusting in ourselves and our own confidence in our walk with God. That we would continue to deal properly with sin and trust you, God, that even in the midst of whatever we find ourselves, there is a joy that we can have in Jesus Christ, an opportunity to serve the living God and worship him with our lives. Help us to do that and to do it well this week. Watch over us, God, as we go. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you for coming. You're dismissed.